For the next um, discussion session moderator, Professor Kiyong Lee, uh, he will uh, moderate this session. Professor Kiyong Lee in our department. Please welcome Thank Professor Kiyong Lee. Thank you, Professor Cho. Uh, yeah, we have uh, three excellent speakers on uh, COVID-19 and environmental health, and uh, we have a discussion uh, session to follow up. Uh, we have a uh, three uh, discussion uh, panel. So I uh, will just start from uh, Dr. Kwon Chan Lee. Uh, he is a principal scientist in Procter and Gamble, uh, and he's located in Singapore. So uh, why don't we go just go ahead uh, from uh, Dr. Lee? Yeah, um, thanks, uh, uh, Professor Lee. Um, and then also from um, Professor Choi for the opportunity to join this um, um, symposium. And uh, I'd like to just put a disclaimer that I'm not a public health um, expert or expert in epidemiology. So this is a great opportunity for me to learn from any of the distinguished um, speakers on their experience. Um, so so I'm, I'm grateful uh, for that. Um, but as an individual that had been experienced in the, um, the SARS-CoV-2 um, pandemic over the past several years, I do want to share some of the, the learnings and comments and, and, and some thoughts. Um, they, they're not new, new um, and a bit probably built from some of the, the speakers have um, alluded to. I'd like to uh, you know, touch on is I will call it the societal communication, which I, I have found that you know, has impact a great deal in terms of how the society managed the pandemic situation um, over the several um, years that we have experienced here. And the reason why I think it's important about communication and the communication not only amongst the uh, health professionals as uh, Brian um, mentioned, is about the communication with the general public. And the reason why it's I think it's important is because a lot of the measures that we are looking at, you know, based on the research, the learning, the policy that we put into is about protecting the general public. And then a lot of actions that they have to take to protect themselves requires action at the individual level, the family, the community to, to work together. So I think the communication that will enable the general public to take these actions at the right time, efficiently, in the right way is crucial. And then it has to rely on the communication. Um, there are three points I'd like to just highlight very quickly. The first one is about education. Education in a way to help everyone understand where they are, what this disease is about, um, but, but not just during the pandemic, but that needs to be continuous um, um, at an ongoing basis, right? And then that education needs to be done in the language that they understand, right? When we talk about PM 2.5, we're talking about the size of the um, air pollutant that will create harmful effect not 2.30 in the afternoon, right? So this is very, very important. Um, and, then, and then I think that's a, a crucial thing that we have to do. The second one is about uh, coordination. Now, the speakers touched quite a bit about what the research understanding, and then that derives lots of actions that, um, that requires the the uh, measures, right, to be implemented as I mentioned. But then that needs to be coordinated and then coordinated in a consistent way so that the public are hearing the same message um, and then they get the same instruction, they understand why and why they need to, to do that. That comes down from the frontline, I mean, the workers in the public health system and then to the jurisdiction right, the jurisdictional governance, meaning that the government that will set up policy and, and measures. 
but then it's very importantly from the jurisdictional um, governance and from the, the health um, uh, professionals to the general public. That needs to be well coordinated um, because if it's not, then it becomes a very messy situation, which I've seen that happening um, again and again in various places during the pandemic. And then I hopefully I've reached the third point, which I um, want to talk about is about trust. And I hope the education and the coordination will help to drive that. And over time, I've seen the loss of trust on science, right? And then the reason about that is things are happening in a way that people get very confusing and then are confused. And then the, the message about why science will, will deliver the right intent and the right uh, action for them to protect themselves was not solid. Um, I'm a trained um, engineer. Um, I've learned uh, fluid me mechanics, right? And then I've never seen that filtration gets debated so much um, in, in my career about, you know, mask at the right design, worn in the right manner, will be able to deliver what the, the intent, right? Um, so all about fluid mechanics about filtration. And then, and then when, when we look at wastewater treatment, and it has done its intent for many, many years, um, but then suddenly it gets debated again and again and again. I think, I hope um, these three will come together to help to drive an implementation of the protection measures for the general public so that we will protect uh, um, the public by educating ourselves and then the general public um, to, to enable that. And finally, it's so um, um, you know, important, um, as Brian mentioned about the, um, you know, the, the extension um, of, the, of the great benefits from the Global Horizon uh, Scanning Project. And I would uh, look forward to um, the same projects that gets um, deployed in other regions, because I, I think we may be surprised as we look into Latin America, Africa, that the health systems will have different problem statements and then different recommendation to um, help to resolve the challenges at the local level. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, next uh, discussion will be done by uh, Professor Naomi Yamamoto. He's uh, from Seoul National University. Okay, uh, thanks so much for uh, the introduction. Uh, also, I'd like to say thanks so much for the lecturer for a uh, really intriguing, uh, inspiring talk. Uh, so overall, I felt uh, by, by listening to uh, your wonderful talk, uh, I felt the, uh, the importance of, of uh, identifying hidden environmental problems. Uh, so, so I learned a lot. There are many uh, hidden environmental problem caused by a uh, COVID pandemic. For, for instance, Professor Tuasandi talked about you know, racial, ethnic, gender, uh, income equality uh, caused by pandemic in uh, New York City. So in Asia, we don't really know uh, how, uh, how uh, you know, the pandemic caused impact disproportionately among the uh, population. Uh, so by listening to uh, his talk, uh, I uh, feel the importance to identify uh, hidden, like vulnerable, <coughs> vulnerable subpopulation who are at the special risk of the pandemic. Uh, also, I was really shocked to know that uh, there are more women who do not wish to get pregnant due, due to a pandemic. So it's kind of like unforeseeable uh, for, for, for us, at least like for me. So it also uh, taught me, like uh, remind me about importance to uh, discover, like reveal or un uncover a hidden environmental problem that were unforeseen, but uh, can be caused by pandemic. 
since you know I, I'm a teacher of a university, I really uh, felt the importance to teach the student to be uh, uh, scientifically curious enough and also like scientifically imaginative enough to uh, discover uh, the problem uh, previously unknown. Uh, so I think it's not really interesting to study what we already uh, know. Uh, so we need to be someone who can identify something uh, previously unknown. So that's something you know, I, I, I uh, could do by, by listening uh, the presentation. Uh, also, uh, for, for that, I, I felt uh, it's really uh, important to make like a non-traditional collaboration, uh, as Professor Brooks uh, pointed out. Uh, so uh, the COVID pandemic is such a like, you know uh, interdisciplinary efforts needed. I, I, I think so. For, for instance, may, maybe uh, we should collaborate like a veterinary because you know COVID nineteen it's a zoonotic pathogen. Uh, also, we may be able to collaborate, for instance, like his, historia. So uh, as a professor, uh, Christakis mentioned about like a history pandemic. So I think, you know, by, by collaborating historia, we could learn something uh, about the history and the, also the future, the pandemic. So, so th these are comments I wanted to make. And uh, again, I'd like to say thanks so much for, for the lecture for uh, their uh, wonderful talk. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Yamamoto. Uh, next discussion will be done by uh, Professor Seung-Sub Kim from, from Korea University. Thank you for the introduction. I'm Seung-Sub Kim from Korea University. I'm going to share two research about COVID-19 in South Korea, and then I'm going to ask one question to Professor Trisande. So let me share the, my PowerPoint by. Can you see the, my screen? Yes. So in South Korea, there are several research to show inequality related to COVID-19 in South Korea. Because I'm occupational researcher, I want to share one paper which tried to estimate the number of working population at high risk of COVID-19 infection in South Korea. In South Korea, the, the workers with the job insecurity, mainly temporary worker or daily labor, are at risk of having COVID-19 infection. And this paper showed the prevalence of protective resource. And you can see the daily workers do not have a trade union and they do not have health and safety representative or committee, or they do not have safety management or team dealing with the safety issue in the organization. So these kind of statistics actually show there are vulnerable workers who are at risk of high risk of the COVID-19. And I want to show one finding of uh, showed the COVID-19 related inequality. In South Korea, we have a universal healthcare system. So there are a group of researchers who tried to connect the data set related to COVID-19 using healthcare insurance data set. And then they showed interesting finding here. They checked gradient of COVID-19 infection across a different age group. And the most significant finding were observed in the elderly group. So among the people who are older than 60, you can see there were very strong dose response relationship between income level and COVID-19 infection. Among the Q1 group, the low 25% actually had 39% higher risk of having COVID-19 infection. So it's pretty similar what observed in the US. And then let me ask you uh, one question to the Dr. Professor Tursande. My question is like that. 
in South Korea and in US, there are so many great papers showing that underlying inequality, income inequality or racial inequality are major driving force of COVID-19 related inequality. But in terms of actual intervention, including South Korea and even in US, the government do not, do not have enough research to tackle that kind of underlying inequality because COVID-19 inequality is too urgent. And so every research are talking about underlying inequality is a major force, but in terms of intervention, I often think, what can you do? So I want to get your insight about this kind of situation. Thank you. Thank you for the, the question. If it's okay, if I can respond at this point, that would be great. Um, yes, please. Great. Um, so first, the intervention that we ultimately need is political will. I mean, public health is inherently political. And the inequality we are talking about is driven by a lack of political will to address the underlying social factors that create these disparities. And we've seen across many modern societies over time, a widening, um, looking at the work of Piketty and others, of those inequalities. So that's the first intervention that is needed. Now that is a very um, fanciful idea, that, that's a very remote possibility. Um, when you're talking about pragmatic steps that we can take, I alluded to one potential suggestive uh, intervention, which is more from the perspective of moderating the effects um, by greater family cohesion and intervention to provide, to improve the, the, the household dynamic. But that's intrinsic at some level, indirectly intrinsic um, susceptibility that you're modifying. Um, the other ways that we can address inequality, which would to operationalize on a larger scale would require some, again, political action, but it might be more reasonable, would be either um, cash incentives or other educational or other interventions to um, provide a hand up, if you will, to those populations in society uh, that are less well able um, to, uh, uh, to achieve um, and try to compensate for, for those inequalities. So in, I'm not giving a, a lot in the way of concrete suggestions, but I, I think there are underlying social forces that are going to be more fundamental and harder to modify. And then I think there are potential more concrete steps and intervention studies. I know the economists in particular have done cash incentives and, and methods to try to um, alleviate inequality and they've seen health benefits as a result of those interventions. Um, and I think we have to think creatively about those more concrete interventions uh, to show po progress that policymakers can achieve. Because in the end, the reality is that um, governments do pay when we fail to address underlying inequality. They pay in increased healthcare costs. They pay in other social consequences of, of inequality. So I, I really thank you for the thoughtful question, and I hope I, I was able to provide some insight. Thank you. Uh, now we have a uh, three minute over the time, but um, maybe I can entertain a couple more questions if we have any question from audience. Now, overall, uh, this uh, session uh, I think is very excellent. Uh, we have a very good uh, speakers and also discussion uh, from Dr. Lee and Yamamoto and Kim uh, was very ex excellent. And thank you for your answer, Professor Trasende. And uh, yeah, and uh, I think uh, from this uh, symposium, uh, we uh, because of COVID nineteen, we recognize uh, the importance of our role as an environmental health professional, but also 
uh, I, I learned that we have to expand our perspectives uh, just from our traditional role to a more diverse uh, area. And um, I think uh, hopefully in, in the future, we can actually uh, handle this pandemic, next pandemic, uh, a little bit with a better uh, hand. Uh, do we have any question from audience? Uh, yeah, I think uh, Professor Cho uh, Chair, uh, Kyung-ho Chair has a quick question for uh, Professor Ko. The, Professor Ko, are, are you sleeping or still wake up? <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm reading it in, I'm reading okay. it in, that, the, in, the, a, in the chat. Okay, there's a question in chat -in. After pandemic, what kinds of effort can be designed in terms of identifying hot chemicals of potential public health threat? Sure. <laughs> uh, I think the, the, the chemicals won't really change after the pandemic. It'll be the same. But uh, I think as, as, uh, as uh, already Professor Chris Takis said, we will have a post-pandemic phase and we will maybe have something like the 20s, like in the last century of wild love and happiness and joyfulness and people will hang out and go out. We will maybe see changes in lifestyle and that always goes along with changes in chemical exposures. And as Leo pointed out, of course, social inequalities will also find their reflection in chemical exposures. So I am sure we will see a going up and down of chemical exposures, some, some um, subpopulations going down, some subpopulations going up. Um, that is, I, Leo did uh, interesting work on the, on the health burden, on the, on the burden and the cost burden of the disease of chemical exposures. And I think we will see this in, in the post pandemic era. We will see changes, but I think there will not be new chemicals. It will be those chemicals on the market when we see shifts going on there. Yeah, I think we should keep an eye on uh, new chemical, hot chemical uh, to manage uh, for better work. Uh, 